Happy to see you again, wonderful people. Welcome to PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight, she's a foremost child health expert. And even though she was born in England, she's been teaching and taking care of children in Ghana since 1971. Professor Janet Nikwe, she renovated the Kolebu Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. And she's the main author of the Pediatric Officer's Handbook, plus some other 60 publications. At 76, she was head of the Child Health Unit at the University of Ghana Medical School and retired, but is still working hard for Mother Ghana. Professor Janet Nikwe, good to see you. How have you been? I'm fine, thank and you. And congratulations for all the wonderful work you've been doing. Thank you. Right, so let's talk about you. I know you were born in England in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. You had your primary education, had your college at the all-girls school, right? Yes. How generally was it like growing up in England? Well, at the time I was small, we still had uh, wartime food rationing. So that's one of my earliest memories, having okay. had food stamps. Uh, but later on, also, there was no TV, so it was different from now. Okay. I went to a grammar school, which was eight miles away, so I had to take a bus every day to get to school. Whether it was snowing or what, we had to go to school. Mm -hmm. And then I went to medical school in London, mm -hmm. uh, and then worked for about two years after graduating, before coming to Ghana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 1971, mm -hmm. you, you decided to come to Ghana to work with Kolebu and the University of Ghana Medical School. But prior to that, had you been to Ghana before that no, time? No, I had no knowledge of Ghana whatsoever. Okay. Uh, the only thing I knew about Ghana was that you exported cocoa. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Um, but I came because I married my husband, who is Ghanaian. Okay. Yes. So you met your husband in the UK? Yes, at medical school. How did that happen? We were in the same class. Although we didn't <laughs> meet at class, we met at a party. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, one thing led to another. I mean, tell me the story. How did it happen? Well, he was the main chef for the party. Okay. So he was making some wonderful curry. Uh -huh. And then we just got chatting, that's all. And then... <laughs> Interesting. But let's talk about the journey so far. From 1971 at Kolebu, then to the University of Ghana Medical School. How has it been? Well, in 1971, I was with the Ministry of Health. Okay. And I worked initially at Child Health. And then I was transferred to the casualty in Kolebu and then again to Kolibu Polyclinic. Okay. So I worked for about two years uh, before we decided to do postgraduate exams, mm. which meant going back to Britain. Okay. So we went back to Britain in 1974 and got our exams, came back as specialists in 1976 and then joined the medical school. Mm. Mm. But even before I talk about some of the um, if you've had challenges working in all these offices, mm -hmm. you could have stayed in the UK with your husband. What really influenced you or motivated you to come to Ghana? Well, my husband was rushing back to get to Ghana. That's, <laughs> that's the, the reason I came here. Yes, we could easily have stayed there. Mm. Yes. Okay. And uh, for you, you love children. So yes. let's talk about why the love for children. Uh, well, it's more of a, a love for the um, the work. I mean, working with children is, is very important and very interesting. Okay. Mm. I mean, what's the interest? What really um, motivates you to actually work hard and also, you know, want to be with children all the time? It's an academic interest. They have mm. very interesting diseases. Um, it's very easy to get on with the mothers and to treat the children. Mm. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about your journey at Kolibu first. What would you describe? Where have the, has there been challenges? Well, um, 
The worst period was in 1983, round about there, 1984, after the military coups, okay. when everything, everything was very, very bad in Ghana. Um, there were severe shortages of medical equipment, drugs, uh, food, even kenki you couldn't buy. Okay. At the same time, there were shortages of water. In this area, you couldn't get water. Uh, shortages of petrol. And then, because of lack of rainfall, the Akasombo Dam, uh, the lake ran out of water. So they couldn't power the electricity generators properly. So we had prolonged electricity uh, blackouts. Sometimes we were on for 12 hours and off for 24 hours. Wow. It was even worse than Dumso. <laughs> <laughs> so at times, you know, in those days people didn't have generators. So at times I have to send the mothers from Kolibu back home to bring in kerosene lamps wow. so that we could work. Wow. Yes, it was very bad. Hmm. And because um, there was a shortage of medicines. Um, it was very hard to actually treat patients. Mm. Sometimes they had to go to town to buy like penicillin or even anti-malarials. Yes. Wow. And around that time, the government brought in cash and carry. If you didn't have any money, you, it was difficult to buy anything in the hospital. Yeah. Mm. What, what, what's your memory of um some of the worst cases you've had to handle at the hospital? Oh, sometimes children are very, very sick, especially with malaria. Um, they can come in unconscious, convulsing. Mm. Um, and until recently, there was no intensive care unit for older children. Yeah. Um, so these diseases are very serious. Children die, you know. Oh, wow. Mm. Well, I know that you went back to the UK to further your studies and then you came back to Ghana. But I mean, ever since then, you've been teaching and you've been practicing. Mm -hmm. Among the two, which one do you love most? They are intertwined because as a, a medical teacher, you are teaching while you are practicing. Okay. So it's more like an apprenticeship for the for the students. Mm. They they watch you doing things yeah. and then they learn from their books, but okay. they are watching how you work. Mm. So it's very important for the medical teachers to work in a, a responsible way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you love both. Yes. Let me ask you, I'm sure by now you have a gun name. Yes. Do you have one? I don't know if I have a gun name. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband did he give you one? No. <laughs> but which one would you love if you were to be given a gun name? Oh, I, I can't answer you that. Could. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but you speak guy yourself? I do. You yes. do? Yes. So you're a thing. Oyo Jubba. Oyo Yes. Oyo I uh, speak it okay, but I had to speak in the hospital because most of the mothers didn't speak English. Okay. So if you ask me something medical, I may answer. Okay. <laughs> That's, but, but you've been living with your husband for this long, game, you Yes, still? but we speak English. <laughs> Oh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm more interested, uh, interested in the period um, that you, you were at the hospital and I know that there were hard times like you mentioned mm -hmm. and personally how did you cope because you're not a Ghanaian here you are you have to sleep 24 hours in the dark and all. how did you cope? Um, well first of all I'll talk about in the hospital um, when there were shortages of everything um, I managed to get help from the British High Commission and they they flew in a lot of medicines and equipment uh, for child health mm. and they did this is quite interesting they did that at a time when Nigeria expelled a million Ghanaians yeah. and they arrived back in Ghana expecting to be housed in um, a refugee camp mm. But so that's why the embassy gave the equipment for these refugees. Okay. But actually, when they arrived back in Ghana, mm. they um, 
managed to disperse to their villages. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of drugs and so on, which kept us running for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I did, remember that um, children who are poor get sick much more often. Yeah. And if you are poor in an emergency, you don't have money to pay for things. Yeah. So if you arrived at Child Health, I organized um, something called Ask the Pharmacist system, okay. so that if the doctor in charge wrote in the notes, dear pharmacist, please supply this, then the emergency drugs were supplied initially without the patient paying, okay. but, and then the money was recouped later when things had settled down. Mm. Oh, wow, that's interesting. But personally, um, things were really very, very difficult. Um, without petrol, it was hard to get to Kolobu. Mm. Um, my husband had a system of friends, one in the garage, okay. one in the multi-stores. Uh, I had one in the toilet paper factory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And somehow we managed, you know, he would go out and come back with, for example, six tins of milk and four bars of soap. Okay. And therefore we managed along the way. <laughs> <laughs> would you say this difficulty impacted, had any impact on your work as a pediatrician? Well, it made it very much more difficult. Mm. Uh, we had to try much harder. Mm. Mm. So, um, this dear pharmacist you talk about, mm. was there any actually any incident that actually triggered or motivated you to initiate this? Well, the fact that um, sick children were coming, needing, for example, an antibiotic, mm. which the government says you have to pay for immediately, and the patient has no money. Yeah. And therefore, this is heartbreaking, you know, you, you see a patient who needs particular drugs and you can't get them. So yes, that, that's what motivated me to set that up. At what point did you have to go to Saudi Arabia and why? Um, we left for Saudi Arabia, we were due for sabbatical leave from the university. Okay. Um, but it was turned down actually because um, of shortage of staff. But we had children to educate, and therefore, and the universities at that time were closing. So I think Legon was closed for two years. Yeah. So we decided, for their sake, we had to leave Ghana, and we took leave of absence mm. and went to Saudi Arabia. Okay. And so you had to go and train your children in Saudi Arabia. No, we, we the jobs we had in Saudi Arabia paid for them to school in Britain. Oh, okay. Yes. And how long was that? That was two years. Two years, and yes. then you came back to We Ghana. came back. Um, we had enough funds to put them th to continue them in school there. Mm. And so we worked for a while, and then we were actually granted our sabbatical leave. Okay. This was after, I think, 16 years working okay. for the university. Okay. And we spent that in Britain. Mm. Mm. At, at what point would you say that you reached the zenith of your career? Uh, well, I was eventually promoted to full professor in 1991. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I would say then. And, and, I mean, that must have come with a lot of hard work. What really went into that? Um, to become a professor in the university, you have to do a lot of research um, and publish both in local and international journals. Mm. Um, as, as you said, I have published about 60 um, art articles in journals. Mm -hmm. um, I took over, or I started working in the Burkitt's Tumor Project as part of my general work, but when the, the professor who was running the project also had to go abroad, I took it over and continued the work. Mm. Um, then I became very interested in malaria because we had so many cases of children yeah with severe malaria because at that time, although it wasn't proven at that time, chloroquine which was used was becoming, uh, the, the parasites were becoming um, resistant to it. Okay. So I did a lot of work proving that there was this resistance and eventually the government um, took the advice and changed the drug that we used for malaria. Mm. So. Uh, then the cases of malaria became less. Mm. 
Okay. Um, I also became very interested in HIV. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As you know, that was a new disease in the world in the early 1980s. Yeah. And originally, people thought it was a disease affecting homosexuals. Mm. But we discovered, my husband and I discovered that here, the patients were mostly female. Okay. And this was um, a, an announcement to the world. The world was very surprised. Um, and then we set about researching why that was so. And we found out that a number of girls left Ghana to work abroad, mm. thinking they were going to be housemaids, but they were forced into prostitution. Okay. And so when they came back, some of them had HIV infection and they gave it to other people. Mm. And that's how it started spreading in Ghana. Mm. Um, I also did some work to find other aspects of why it was spreading mm -hmm. and found out that traditional healers at that time, sometimes they were using knives to scarify patients. And um, these knives were not sterilized. They were simply used from patient to patient. So we were able to give some advice to the traditional healers as to how to improve their treatment. Yeah. Um, one particular piece of research what I was very happy about. Uh, we were seeing a number of babies admitted to the ward, um, very, very ill, and some of them died. And asking the mother what had been going on, some of them said they had been using a particular plant as an enema or a snuff for their baby who had a cold. Mm -hmm. And then one night, a baby came in with the same problem. Um, I found that the baby's heart was very, very slow. Wow. And I had to sit all night doing heart compressions, you know. Okay. And in the morning, the baby was better. Wow. It didn't die. So I asked the mother to bring in the plant that she'd used. Uh, I didn't know what it was. So I took it to the botany department at Lagon. Mm -hmm. And they said it was something called yellow oleander. Okay. And they also showed me a book where the plant was used as a poison. Oops. Yes. For arrows, for killing people. Goodness. Yes. Um, so I asked the graphic newspaper to come and talk about it. Mm -hmm. They published the paper in the, in the newspaper and we never saw another patient with that problem. Really? So I was very yeah. happy. Mm. Mm. Oh. So, I th as, you know, uh, the research should ideally be, locate, be um, useful for the country that you're doing it in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow, that's quite interesting. I know you also did uh, some work on neonatal jaundice. Yes. And uh, sickle cell. Yes. We'll talk about that, but I'm more interested also in the HIV research you mm -hmm. did. Recently, we're hearing that the infection rate is increasing and mm. um, what could be accounting for that? I think the that people have started ignoring it they're forgetting about it. Mm. At the beginning of the epidemic uh, my husband did a lot of educational work with um, clinics, hospitals, the community, schools. I even went up to Agogo and, and gave a, uh, a talk to the church there. Okay. Um, and pe people have just forgotten about it, basically. It, the, the country needs to keep up with the education. And in fact, I did a survey of how people knew about HIV, and it turned out that the radio was the best medium to get information over to the population. Okay. Mm. Mm. So what would it take? for the numbers to start reducing, as we saw some time ago in Ghana? People have to be aware. Um, people have to use condoms to not have multiple partners. And if you're a pregnant woman, you must be tested. If you're a pregnant woman and you have HIV, mm. you can be given medication to stop the baby catching it from you. Mm. 
Mm. Let's now let's talk about the neonatal jaundice, which mm -hmm. you've also been researching about, and sickle cell in babies. Mm -hmm. If I'm right, what has your research found so far? Uh, in jo the case of jaundice, uh, we found that um, the most common causes of the jaundice mm. were blood group incompatibilities between the baby and the mother. So it's important all pregnant women get their blood tested to see what group they are. And if they are something called rhesus negative, they mm. can be given injections uh, to prevent the baby getting jaundiced. Okay. Um, there's also something called G6PD deficiency, which is something that affects blood cells. And if the mother is using camphor uh, in water or to store the baby's clothes, yeah. that can trigger severe jaundice in her baby. Yeah. So antenatal clinics should be advising against the use of camphor. Um, mm. okay. if, if the baby is jaundiced and it's picked up early, then the baby can be treated. But if it's not seen, then it can lead to severe brain damage in the babies. Mm. So again, uh, knowledge is very important. Mm. What, what really causes neonatal jaundice? Uh, it's the baby's red blood cells breaking down and the products of the breaking down are something called bilirubin, mm. which can, if there's too much in the blood, it can spread into the brain. Mm. Mm. It hasn't got anything to do with sickle cell. No, it's nothing to do with sickle cell. Mm. Sickle cell patients are often jaundiced because they have blood cells breaking down, okay. but not to the same extent as mm. with neonatal jaundice. Mm. Okay, so um, with your research with sickle cell, mm. what was uh, me? What's the highlight of those researches you did? in sickle cell? Yes, I didn't do much research in sickle, in sickle cell. cell. I, I ran the sickle cell clinics, but they're very, very busy clinics. And okay. the only piece of research I did really was to find out um, what sickle cell patients thought of marrying somebody who has a sickle tray. Yeah. And the patients themselves said, no, they wouldn't. They would definitely marry someone who was AA. Okay. However, some of the parents who would be carriers didn't really worry about it. Mm. And um, I think now, I think I've heard that the churches sometimes encourage young couples to test their genotypes, whether they are carriers or not. And that, that would go a long way if people listen to the advice. Mm. Mm. Professor Janet Nikwe, she is a neonatal, she is an expert in child health care and she's been in Ghana since 1971. When I returned from this break she has about 60 publications and uh, in peer-reviewed journals. She's also done a lot of work and as you heard her speak in HIV and other um, areas. She's also done uh, work in what? Lymphomia? Burkitt's lymphoma. lymphoma. When I return from this break, she'll be telling us more about that research and what uh, she found and how that can help improve our child health care system. But she would also be telling me her own assessment of Ghana's child health care delivery, where we are with that. And then she's also, um, among her achievements, she's refurbished the children's emergency room and OPD consulting rooms with funds from the National Commission for Children. All of that she'll be telling us after this break. Stay with me, I'm coming right back. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. My guest is still Professor Janet Nikwe. She is an expert in child health care. Prof, so um, before we went on that break, we were talking about sickle cell and um, the advice that you've been giving to people 
who are carriers? Well, um, it's important to know your sickle cell status, whether you are AA, where there's no sickle cell, or whether you are a carrier, like AS or AC. Mm. Because if you marry somebody who is already, who's also a carrier, then you may have children, not necessarily, but you're, there's a one in four chance that you may have a child who has sickle cell disease. Mm. Having sickle cell disease is quite serious because most, many of the children um, are anemic and they need blood transfusions and they also have bodily pains quite often. Okay. Yeah, so it, it would be better not to have sickle cell disease. Mm. Being a clinic that you set up, the cases that came to you, mm. what mostly were the causes of the sickle cells? Um, patients who were coming to you? The clinic, I didn't set it up, I took it over. Okay. Um, but patients come to the clinic for routine care to check that they are doing well and that they are taking their medications mm -hmm. and also to detect if they have, for example, severe anemia, they might need a blood transfusion or any other problem that can c crop up. Um, the problem with sickle cell children is that they can suddenly become very ill and then they have to be rushed into the emergency room for emergency treatment. Mm. So the aim of the clinic is to try and keep them as well as possible so that they don't have to keep rushing into the emergency room. Mm. <laughs> but Beckett lymphoma, what is that? It's a type of childhood cancer. Um, it has been the most common type of cancer in Ghana, mm. although I think these days other types are catching up. It's basically caused because there's a lot of malaria in the country. Okay. And when you have uh, malaria very often, it can suppress your immune system. Okay. Normally, your immune system will mop up any cancerous cells in the body. Mm. The other factor is that very many infants in Ghana have a, a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, mm -hmm. uh, which is also the virus which causes glandular fever. Okay. But if the infants get it when they're very young, they may have just a mild illness, but they don't get rid of the virus. It stays dormant in the body. Okay. And if they also get malaria, then the malaria suppresses their immune system and the virus can multiply, um, leading to tumours, uh, commonly of the face, but also of the abdomen, and in fact anywhere in the body. Let's talk about your publications, about mm -hmm. 60 of them. Mm -hmm. The latest is uh, Through Thick and Thin. Before we talk about Through Thick and Thin, which I encourage everybody to get, because I'm going to get one for myself today. <laughs> but first, the Pediatric House Officer's Handbook. Yes. Tell me about it. Um, well, um, if you're a house officer on duty in the night, you may be on your own um, and you may get a patient coming in. You need to give a particular drug or do a certain kind of treatment and you need to quickly uh, read up to remind yourself what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, is, this was um, a typed book that fits in the house officer's pocket mm -hmm. and has instructions on how to do emergency yeah. procedures and so on. Um, it was very popular uh, because doctors came from all over Ghana to, to purchase it. It was very, very inexpensive. Okay. You could keep it in your pocket. This was before the days where doctors had um, iPhones and they could look up things on Google. Okay. So it was the only way to really find out what to do in the middle of the night. Yeah. Um, it was typed in the departmental office and then the staff photocopied it and it was sold more or less at cost price. Mm. Um, yeah, I tried printing it as a proper book, but it proved impossible. I sent it to the printers 
they came back with a thousand and one mistakes <laughs> which I corrected and sent back okay. and they came back with even more mistakes <laughs> and that's the kind of book where you can't have a mistake Definitely. because it's, it involves drug dosages. It involves yes. the lives of people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we continued with appropriate technology, mm. yes. It also had the advantage that if there's a, a change in treatment, an update, then you can quickly change it okay. without sending it back to the printers. Okay, mm. so through thick and thin, it's supposed to be autobiography. Yes. Tell me, I mean, putting it together, what really motivated this? Tell I me all about it. I just thought that so much had happened, uh, being in Ghana and all this excitement, I thought it should go down in writing for mm -hmm. at least my children and so on to read. Yeah. Yes. It's also some of the history of, of Department of Child Health and of Ghana. So. I thought it would be interesting. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things and the things <laughs> in the book. Oh, well, it's my, my uh, childhood, my growing up, my medical school days, marriage and so on. Working okay. at Kolibu, working mm. in Saudi Arabia, mm. um, travels recently, retirement. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you're retired now. What, what, what do you do? I do very little now, okay. apart from writing the book. Okay. I play and bridge. Okay. And I I keep fit by swimming and walking. Oh, mm. that's mm. nice. Mm. That's nice. Uh, maybe I'll get to walk with you <laughs> <laughs> and keep fit also. Mm. But I must say you've done quite a lot of work, and um, amongst your achievements, um, uh, the one that really caught me the refurbishment of the children's emergency room, the OPD consulting room with funds from the National Commission for Children, and then introduction of the children's needy fund, the setting up of the NICU, and a lot more. And then, of course, the dear pharmacist you talked about. Yes. In all of this, what was the motivation? Oh, just to make sure the service is running and the children get treated. Mm. Are you fulfilled with all that you did to help that the children get treated? Well, I tried my best. Mm. I think the service in the Department of Child Health remains very good. The doctors, uh, you know, um, started training postgraduate doctors and now they're, more of them are qualifying and training others. Mm. And so the system goes on, yes. Mm. I want us to talk about child health care mm -hmm. in Ghana. Mm -hmm. I mean, you say you did your best and um, you talked about some of the challenges that you had to step in to help deal with. Mm. At the moment, what's your assessment of child health care in Ghana? I think it's a lot better than when I arrived in the country, yes. Um, most children now are immunised against the killer diseases. Um, so for example, uh, diseases like whooping cough and measles are virtually non-existent. And because, partly because measles doesn't happen anymore, the state of nutrition of the children is better. Um, we used to see quite a lot of kwashiorkor, core, which is malnutrition. These days you don't see it very much. Um, HIV is a new problem and with HIV you also get tuberculosis because the HIV children can't fight it off. Yep. And so these are more modern problems. Mm. Yeah. Something like neonatal tetanus doesn't exist if the mothers are immunised against tetanus when they are pregnant. Okay. Um, I think a major problem now with health system in Ghana is that the north and the rural areas are not well served. Okay. Um, medical staff and nurses would rather be in the big centres, mm -hmm. um, partly because when they go to the north, for example, it's difficult for their children to go to school because this, all the infrastructure is not as good as in the towns. Mm. Um, so to improve the health delivery system, you really need to make it more 
medical staff friendly mm -hmm. in those affected areas. Okay. Mm. And, and talking about challenges in practicing healthcare and teaching healthcare, I mean, how would you describe it as? Um, things have improved in, with regard to medical training and salaries. Um, so we have to be careful now that things are temporarily difficult financially in the country. We have to be careful that public servants' salaries and so on doesn't fall behind again. Mm. Because if it does, there's a worldwide demand for medical staff. And if things are bad, people will leave. There might be another brain drain. Yeah, so I know you have three young uh, adult children. Yes. <laughs> and I know you've been married to Professor Nikwe for 51 years. Mm -hmm. That's a long journey. I mean, from the beginning of the interview, you told me how you met at medical school in the UK. Tell me more about that. Oh, well, you just have to, well, we've just got on and we're, we're friends. And, and we, you've been supporting each other? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and the kids, I'm sure now they're adults. Yes, they're adults and we have eight grandchildren now. Oh, wow. Yes. Eight? Yes. Are they all in Ghana? No, they're all abroad they're because in. when things were very, very bad, mm. um, we had to send our children to school in England. The, the universities were closed. Schooling here was difficult. Okay. Mm. So all three are in England? Uh, two are in England. One is in, in California. Okay. Mm. And all your grandchildren. So do you, and do you get to meet them sometimes? Oh, yes, yes. You go on holidays? Yes, we meet them every year. Yes. Okay, mm. that's interesting. And uh, the gar. So you want to? You you only know the one that you can speak to your patients. So which ones do you know? Well, I can go shopping. <laughs> okay, and speak gar. Yes, I can do. Uh, if I go to the market and, and they hear me speaking gar, then the price is cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Okay. So what did you tell them? I could say, um, am I dying? Any, any, any. Oh, okay, that's how much. Yes. Okay, and uh, would you want them to give you a discount or something? <laughs> <laughs> eh? uh, that's temporarily slipped my mind. <laughs> Oh, and so um, the um, your children, how many boys, how many girls? Uh, one girl, two boys. One bo girl, two boys. Yes. Do they speak Ga? Uh, so? My daughter speaks some Ga, yes. She speaks some, yes. some Ga. Okay, mm. so she lived here some for some time. Oh, yes. Or her father had to teach her. Uh, she English. went to her grandmother to teach her. <laughs> oh, quite interesting. Mm. So, so w where exactly is your husband from? He's from Bukum. Bukum. Yes. Have you been there before? Yes. <laughs> you mean to Bukum? Yes. So when you go there, how do you relate to them? Oh, well, no, his mother now lives in Abasokai. So okay. Yes. And do you speak now with your, your uh, mother-in-law? I do a little, yes. So what do you tell I, her? I toyote. Toyote. She'll, yes, she'll yeah. say. And, and if she asked you toyote, Mm. You would respond. I would say, "Me or Juba." Me or Juba. Oh, nice. <laughs> you you may not be black, and you may not be a Ghanaian, but you've given a lot to Ghana. Do you ever regret doing that? No, no, no. It's been very interesting. Mm. Yeah. What's your fulfilment? Well, just going, just living here and um, doing, trying to help the Department of Child Health. Yes. Mm. So now that you're retired, if you're not, you were not teaching, you were not um, taking care of children, what, what would you be doing? What, what are your hobbies? Oh, I play bridge. Okay. I read and um, I concentrate on keeping fit, okay. swimming and walking. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and doing some traveling. Every year. Every mm -hmm. year. Yes. Just to keep busy. Yes. Oh, good. I must say, you, you look fit for seven and six. Yes. And it means that, I mean, your keep fit activities is really paying. 
Do, do you listen to music sometimes? Sorry? Do you listen to music sometimes? Sometimes, yes. Okay. Mm. There's TV and there's Netflix and so on. Okay. Mm. Do you, which genre of music do you listen to? Sorry? Which genre of music do you listen to? Uh, anything. Jazz. Mm -hmm. Jazz. Mm. Okay. Do you listen to some Ghanaian music? Yes, sometimes. Do you have a favorite? No. <laughs> <laughs> Any that you remember? No. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's high life, yes. It's high life, yes. but you don't have a favorite. No. But you enjoy it, oh, you yes. enjoy it anyway. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, what's your advice to um, government, for instance, in, in making sure that we take child health care seriously in this country? Well, I think government does take child health care seriously. And, you know, it's very important for, to keep up the immunization schedules. The mm. public health nurses do a very good job. Mm. I think Ghana is one of the countries where most children are immunized. Yes. Okay. To um, improve child health generally, it means improving everybody's financial status, yes. you know, because if parents can't afford things, the children don't get enough to eat. Definitely. And if you don't eat well, then you're prone to infectious diseases. Definitely. So it, it's, uh, um, child health is related to the whole country's economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Professor Janet Nikwe, thank you so much for talking to us. And I must say, we're really grateful for all the time you spent in Ghana. We appreciate your effort. God bless you. Viewers, thank you so much for watching. Same time next week, we'll be bringing you another interesting edition of PM Personality Profile. My beautiful dress was made by Needle Thread Designs. Visit their showroom in Tesano. My name is Aishu Brian. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.